Kevin, and thanks for the invitation. And more importantly, I guess, thanks to NCBC for highlighting some of the biotechnology associated with animal ag and animal ag food production. So as the first speaker in the series or first speaker today, I guess I'm tasked with introducing the topic and trying to set the stage for everybody in the room. I'm really excited to sort of see the great turnout for an animal ag topic. Uh, I know looking around the room, we've got a lot of smart, technically minded, technically capable people, but not necessarily everybody's working in the microbiome space. And so you folks are coming from all different aspects of the uh, biotech industry. So sort of want to start off broad and, and then dial down toward the end, talk a little bit about the research we're doing. Um, so to kick off, when you start thinking about the microbiome, especially for those who have heard of it but don't really know much more about it than just a vocabulary word or a, or a concept talked about on TV, um, the thing to really keep in mind is the, the big difference about the microbiome or the sort of the seismic shift in how we approach microbiology and gut health today versus what we did or what we have done for the last 70 years as it relates, you know, post-World War II and the invention of antibiotics. You know, a lot of our approach to antibiotics was not that different from how Donald Trump approaches immigration. I've changed the quote a little bit uh, to make it a little bit more t <laughs> germane today's topic, but essentially for the last 70 years, we knew most of the bugs in the gut weren't pathogenic and most, a lot of them were actually good for us, but we decided that the bad guys were bad enough, no matter how small they were, that we weren't gonna deal with the good guys, and we weren't even gonna really take the time to figure out who was who. We were just gonna use our antibiotic wall and sterilize ourselves and our animals. <clears throat> oh, baby, forward. Where's the... <laughs> I've, I've apparently been trumped. So we had this sort of sterilizing effect, or, we, well, we'll separate ourselves from nature. The bacteria is all bad, or even the good ones aren't good enough. But then the last 15 or so years, we started to recognize that the developed world's got a lot more problems with allergies, autoimmune diseases, even metabolic diseases that the developing world doesn't have. And we started to recognize that maybe we're too clean. 400 million years of animals evolving in the presence in, around, and, and containing bacteria maybe we needed some of those good guys back. And so we needed to start to figure out ways to know who the good guys are and who the bad guys are. And so that's sort of where the microbiome comes from. So this concerted effort across all of science to develop the tools to really figure out who's in the gut, especially those we can't grow yet, and start to parse out good from bad, and also what good health comes, good health outcomes are some bacteria more associated with than others. So, the microbiome specifically is, or technically, is the sum total of all the bacterial genomes in the gut or in an environment. But sort of slang on the street, or even the way I'll use it, is sort of much more of a catch-all of studying microbial ecology using more molecular and proteomic and metabolomic tools that we'll talk a little bit more as we get into stuff. So while this has been a hot topic, and really right now is, is sort of a lot of that, that excitement and the sex appeal of the microbiome is being driven on the biomedical side of stuff. I would argue ag in general, and because we're talking about animal ag today, it's ag, animal ag specifically, we've been working in gut health and gut microbiology for over a century. Even with all the advances in human medicine and the microbiome, we probably still know more about how bacteria regulate the health and performance of dairy cattle than any other species on planet Earth. And a lot of that is because we have to. Uh, people aren't going to pay as much for one McNugget as they are for one pill of Lipitor. The business model and the market forces that drive food production, especially food animal production, are fundamentally different from biomedicine. And so we've got the same health challenges, we've got the same issues we've got to deal with, but we've got to figure out a way to do it and produce a product that is still affordable and something that consumers are willing to actually pay at the, ch at the grocery store checkout counter. Those challenges actually got a little harder here recently. Um, late 2014, I think, um, President Obama's uh, executive order for com combating antibiotic resistance came out, and essentially this started the final countdown, or seems to have started the final countdown, for the use of antibiotics in food animals. 
So as those things go away, at least initially as growth promotants, and then maybe even eventually go away altogether, our challenges get even stronger. Uh, how do we protect and, and prevent disease in animals? And are there ways to actually restore some of the antibiotic growth promoting potential that, that antibiotics are, are seen to give? So the microbiome seems to be able to address, maybe not say all of these or be as good, but there are bits and pieces of it that definitely seem to be part of what uh, capable of, of doing this and also maybe replace it in a way that's less expensive than some stuff that we might be attuned to in, in biomedicine. So, so now <clears throat> we sort of pivot a little bit away from the, the broad introduction and start getting in a little bit more about what my group does. We're interested in disease resistance and immunology and immune resistance to, to pathogens, more specifically in the gut. And so we've been working, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project we've been doing for the past 10, 15 years now. And this is really actually the project that got us into the microbiome research to begin with. Um, and so we know that microbiome and, and gut colonization is important in gut development, mucosal immune development, it, obviously digestion, synthesis of, of nutrients, the bacteria produce a lot of factors that we can't produce ourselves. So the question is how do we harness all this raw potential inside the intestines of animals and of people to actually benefit health overall. So I'm going to go through the next couple of slides, four or five slides. This is all published work, so I'm going to go through it pretty quick. This is mostly just background. I sort of give you guys the stage of how we got to our microbiome project. But essentially, this all stems around a project where we've been working with a commercial probiotic called Premalac. It's a consortium of four different bacteria. And essentially, we feed it to day-old broiler chicks over the course of three to four weeks, depending on, on our experimental conditions or, or experimental question. And it's mixed in the feed, and they sort of consume it continually. And we're asking the question, and sort of initially asking the question, how does this particular commercial probiotic affect animal health and, and bird performance? And so summarizing about three or four PhD students in the five minutes, I'm going to go really quick. But essentially, at the beginning, the sort of the first observations were <clears throat> when we add this to the feed, the intestines look different. The villi are taller, the gut's more regular. Essentially, the, the, the gut looks healthier. When we start looking at the whole animal, looking outside the gut, what we found is actually somehow, some way, and we're still working on why, how the animal uses energy changes. The whole, the whole sum total of energy, the whole sum total of feed consumed just stays the same, but in the intestine, we actually find lower respiration, so less metabolic cost going on, less energy consumed in the intestine. And we initially started seeing increases in energy consumption in immune tissue. So that led us to actually look at the immune tissue, or immune cells specifically. So when we'd isolate circulating lymphocytes and look at how much energy they're consuming, animals fed the probiotic consume or have more ATP per cell and actually use more ATP per cell faster. So they're more energetic, and they're actually burning it off faster, which actually correlates with if we give them an immune challenge when we're, when we're uh, treating them with a probiotic, they actually respond to antigen in an antigen-specific antigen fashion faster. So over the course of four weeks, we get the same amount of antibody produced, but actually within one, maybe even two weeks out, the probiotic has higher levels of antibodies than the controls. This was a non-infectious challenge because we were doing our, our energy studies as well, and we didn't want to have the amount of energy consumed by the pathogen complicating stuff. But the, the assumption is, or at least the, the hypothesis right now, is you get 7 to 10 days antibody response faster, then you clean up the infection sooner, the animal goes back to growth, ideal growth conditions sooner, and you may still have a bump in production during the infection, but that bump is a lot slower, or sorry, a lot shorter, because of <clears throat> this rapid immune response. So how is feeding something in the, or putting the, uh, probiotics in the feed, how is this actually translating to something in the systemic immune response? And again, I'm not going to go through, this is a really busy slide, and I'm not going to go through it in much detail, other than just sort of summarize. <clears throat> we, we looked at the transcriptional differences in the gut between treated and controlled animals, and the take home was we found treated animals, probiotic fed animals, have changes in 
the expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So these are things that are related to the immune system. Typically, when you have an inflamed gut, your intestine doesn't absorb nutrients as well. It's a major part of fighting off infection, but if you don't need it, then it just sort of gets in the way of normal physiology, at least in the intestine. In the ileum, we, curiously, we found pro-inflammatory cytokine expression goes down, and in the cecum, it goes up. So it depends on where you look. But in either case, this, this, the same pathway was being tickled by our probiotic uh, treatment, which sort of leads us to what's going on in the gut. So like I said, that was f seven years of research condensed down into a, a torrent of, of slides, sort of get us to this point in terms of what's going on in the gut. So uh, all the stuff I'm going to show you from this point forward um, is work done by Anne Ballou, who's a senior PhD student in our group, um, and I'm not sure, Anne was presenting a poster on campus, and she's going to be here a little late. I don't know if she's here yet or not. Um, Anne's going to be finishing up this fall, so she's going to be looking for a job, and <laughs> she's not really excited about being in academia, so I'm just saying. Uh, pay attention to the next couple of slides if you guys are hiring. Um, so essentially, she joined our group pretty much about where I just sort of stopped the story. Um, and picked it up with trying to figure out what's changing in the microbiome. And so she started off using this technique. <clears throat> I'm not going to get into the weeds of how this works, but essentially she's able to run PCR around a specific region of one gene that's in most bacteria or all bacteria and use that to get a sort of DNA fingerprint of sorts and identify theoretically everybody who's there with the idea that we can figure out who's there and how they may be changing from, from treatment group to treatment group. And I, I meant to say at the beginning, I'll go ahead and uh, thank you, MoBio, all this data from here on is using their stuff. Uh, <laughs> so the first big take home is pr the probiotic treatment isn't fundamentally changing who's there. There are a few differences. You know, there's a couple of bugs that are only in the probiotic and there's a couple of things that are only in the control, but for the most part, the differences that we're seeing don't seem to be because we fundamentally changed who's in the gut. What we've really done is change the relative abundance of who's in the gut. And again, I'm not, there's, we got 500 different bacteria uh, back from this gigabytes worth of data, so I'm not going to go line by line, but just sort of highlight the two biggies, the ones that changed the most in this data set at least. Lactobacillus uh, was the biggest change, and that's not entirely surprising because lactobacillus is the major component of the probiotic that we're feeding to the, to the intestine or to the, to, the, to the birds. The second one here, however, um, is historically been known as segmented filamentous bacteria. It's an unculturable agent that's been identified in pretty much all species they've looked in it so far. And it's one of its major hallmarks is it promotes the growth and production of IL-17, which is one of the major pro-inflammatory cytokines in the gut which ties in with our anti-inflammatory gene expression stuff we were seeing before, as well as something I didn't show you guys earlier. This is scanning electron micrographs from years previous experiments where we actually, these are segmented filamentous bacteria in the controls, and they actually decrease and go away. We can see it by scanning electron micro microscopy, as well as by whole gene, or, uh, 16S sequencing, that this probiotic through two different methods has changed who's in the gut in a way that we can tie back to the immune system. But who's there is just part of the story. Um, it may not necessarily just be what tax are there. Uh, I don't necessarily think that the host really cares whether you have lactobacillus or not. In most cases, you just need somebody who can make something that lactobacillus can make. If another bug can do it, then that's what, why does the host otherwise need to quibble over what tax is there? Just make me what I want. So. That gets into another area of sort of microbiome research, the metabolome, and understanding the metabolites that are made by different bacteria. And so Anne did an analysis. This is a way to sort of predict uh, should we spend the insane amount of money it takes to do metabolomics um, that takes the 16S gene that she sequenced and then infer all the other genes that should be in that sample because that bacteria is there and then look at how is the constellation of these different pathways changing independent of taxa. So is my ability, are the genes for fermenting X changing independent of whether or not it's a lactobacillus or a bacillus or whatever else? And so this is a way to look at more just in terms of biochemically how is the probiotic or how is the treatment changing the microbiome. And so when she does that, she finds a whole lot of different differences. 
The first couple are so generic that we really can't do anything with. Starch and sucrose metabolism. Yeah, that's you know, 400 bazillion genes there we can't figure anything out with. Glycolysis, yeah, that's probably really important too, but you know, how are we going to tell out of the bazillion of genes involved with that? As we sort of move through the different list and we get a little bit more and more specific, one that's, I'll sort of blow up, that's significant or uh, to us jumped out is this uh, butanoate metabolism, sort of, which is tied to butyrate. And for those, I didn't otherwise know this before doing this project myself, for those who were like me, uh, butyrate is one of the preferred foods of the gut intestinal cells. Um, and it's also tied directly to promoting anti-inflammatory conditions, turning off, NF, or it's been related in terms of ameliorating inflammatory bowel, turns off NF-kappa B, and it decreases expression of IL-12, which is actually the pathway that I told you about before that was up in one, up in the ileum and down in the cecum, or vice versa. Um, so this, again, we can link this back to another bit of previous data. It's, science is always great when stuff actually starts to line up and point in the same direction. So that has sort of led us to a point of uh, this working model that we're, we're trying to finalize is probiotics or probiotic-derived factors are decreasing species that promote inflammation. This is sort of what we're working on our, our working hypothesis. That decreased inflammation is leading to more energy available for the defense or for however else the animal wants to, to spend that extra energy. And that these host factors and or bacterial factors are then crossing the gut to stimulate or otherwise communicate with the systemic immune response or systemic immune cells. So what's that mechanism? How those two actually tie together? Um, so for the most part, that's going to be the subject of a later talk. Um, most likely in fall when Ann defends, because um, right now she's wrapping up that data and trying to uh, sort of put the last bit of, of dotting the I's and crossing the T's types of stuff. But essentially, just to sort of summarize of what she's doing to get there is tying together several other omics projects where we've, we know what the microbiome is doing based on the 16S sequencing. Now she started to do some metabolomics, both the, and, and focusing on both the serum and the digestive to see can we find metabolites that are upregulated in the treated animals and not in the controls that correlate between the digesta and the gut, because it would maybe indicate that something's being signaled across the gut where it's coming from. And we've got malware. Um, <clears throat> from there, I don't have a keyboard, so what's it do? Oh, like nine layers of. <laughs> so metabolomics, she's already right now in the process of trying to analyze transcriptomics where she's actually stimulated immune cells and looked at how these factors have changed gene expression in immune cells to see then can we use that signaling pathway to sort of walk ourselves backwards up to the cell membrane to the receptor and figure out what might be binding there to induce changes in the immune response. And then finally doing proteomics again on the digest and, and the sera because What's talking to the immune cells may be a metabolite, it may be a protein, and so we're trying to triangulate on this from all sides, with hopefully the ultimate sort of goal being, can we get to a point where we know what bugs are turned on what that then becomes sort of a dimmer switch for the immune system. And when we need more immune response, we know what metabolite or what protein or what bacteria to add in a way to get a more vigorous immune response, but when we don't need that thing, we don't need the immune response because the immune system's expensive to run, we can throttle back on it and all that energy then can, can be devoted to, to growth and, and other per performance and production types of traits. So with that, I'll briefly acknowledge those who help support the work and also because I'm gonna try and reverse this sort of Trump approach to the microbiome, <clears throat> encourage people to not be afraid of your microbiome. <laughs> <laughs>